Hey guys, I'm not usually a fan of adjustable gas blocks, but I am slowly coming around on the rifle speed gas block after I used one to fix the gassing issues on my Ruger SFAR. I've also been working on a modern dissipator build. This is kind of a companion piece to my modernized Anderson A4 dissipator, sort of a compare and contrast between a modern dissipator and a modernized retro dissipator. I've also come to realize that the rifle speed gas block and a dissipator build are a perfect match for each other. Tuning a dissipator really calls for an adjustable gas system. It's hard to get the job done just with buffer weights and springs. And all of the potential downsides that I can think of with the rifle speed are essentially a non-issue on a dissipator because of where the gas system is located. So let's take a look at this build. I'll explain what I'm talking about and uh, walk you through some of the weird troubleshooting that I had to do to get this to come together the way that I like it. Let's go for it. This video was made possible in part by supporters of the channel on Subscribestar and today's sponsor, Venture Surplus. One frequently overlooked part of a good cold weather sleep system is a comfortable warm hat. I don't know many people who sleep with their entire head in a sleeping bag and you lose a lot of heat through your head. There are two ways to keep the heat inside your cranium. One is to grow a thick head of luxurious hair and the other is to wear a beanie or as they say in Canada, a toque. All right, settle down Canada. This isn't Tolkien, it's just a hat. Right now, Venture Surplus is sitting on a treasure trove of American-made cold-weather headgear, including grid fleece hats and a more traditional knit wool hat. I'm from the Pacific Northwest, so I have beanies strategically placed in every room, every backpack, and I think I've got one or two in my car. Check out Venture Surplus at the link in the video description. There's also a discount code, which will get you 10% off your order. Also, this is kind of unrelated, but Venture Surplus is an official dealer of North American Rescue, so they're a good place to pick up authentic medical supplies. You don't want to be buying tourniquets and gauze and stuff like that from disreputable dealers or Amazon.com. Thanks to Venture for sponsoring this video. Thank you guys very much for watching. Let's get back to the show. All right, let's get cracking. And by cracking, I think you know what I'm talking about. Before we start, we have to begin by defining the term dissipator, or at least the way we're going to be using it for the video, because otherwise, some jerk on Reddit with an eminently slappable face will point out that technically dissipator refers to a specific model of Bushmaster rifle, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about Vietnam dissipators, Colt Model 605 dissipators. We're talking about the longest possible gas system on the shortest possible barrel. Usually on the commercial market, this refers to a 16 inch barrel with a rifle length gas system, but really the same thing applies to any extremely short dwell time system. So it could be 12 and a half inch barrels with a mid length gas system, which we've talked about before, or perhaps even a 10.3 inch barrel with a carbine length gas system. Anytime you have a gas system that is longer than typical for the barrel length that you're dealing with, you end up with kind of a dissipator situation, and all of those can benefit from adjustable gas systems like the rifle speed gas block. The main problem with extremely short dwell time systems is that no company really wants to sell a product that only works when suppressed, which means that in order to get these guns to cycle, they have to hog out the gas port. Dwell time is the period after which the bullet has passed the gas port, but before it has exited the barrel, that's the duration of time in which the system is under pressure. So if you have a very short dwell time, like on a 16 inch barrel with a rifle length gas system, there's only a couple of inches between the gas port and the end of the barrel. That means there's a very, very short window of time where the system is pressurized and you can actually drive the action. And so if you want to get that gun to cycle reliably, you're going to have to blow out the gas port really huge so you can get a lot of gas into the system really fast. This is compounded by the fact that there are a bunch of different companies making a bunch of different loads of 5.56 or 2.23 spec ammunition. So if you're one of the very few companies who's even willing to sell a dissipator style barrel, you're probably going to want to hedge your bets against different types of ammunition and also account for the potential of fouling, atmospheric conditions, whatever. The upshot is that all of these barrels and uppers and complete rifles will probably work just fine out of the box, albeit they might be a little bit under gassed. For example, that Anderson A4 dissipator that I reviewed is a little bit under gassed out of the box. The problem, of course, is that if you do put a suppressor on there, you immediately reverse the gassing situation and end up with a very overgassed rifle. For example, that Anderson A4 dissipator. 
Now, if you could just restrict that gas flow, the dissipator barrel is actually an extremely good choice for a suppressor host because suppressors add a whole bunch of bonus dwell time at the end of the gun. Not that like a five inch long suppressor is going to add five inches of effective dwell time. It's gonna be a lot less than that because suppressors are not the same as barrel. There are several ways to permanently restrict the gas flow on your dissipator barrel for use with a suppressor. One of those would just be a manufacturer who didn't hog out the gas port to allow the gun to shoot unsuppressed. Another option would be to use a tuned gas tube like the ones from Black River Tactical to permanently restrict the flow of gas into the system. Then you would end up with a gun that has to be suppressed 100% of the time. And despite the obvious advantages of direct thread cans and permanently suppressed firearms, most suppressor owners don't want to do that. I could make a video trying to convince you that direct thread cans are superior, but as you can probably see from the number of fast attached suppressor mounts that I've got in my inventory, I'm not 100% sure I believe it myself. Anyway, the correct answer, and I can already tell this video is running ridiculously long, is an adjustable gas block or maybe an adjustable bolt carrier group like the bootleg BCG. I'm going with adjustable gas block, but as you guys may already know, I don't really like most adjustable gas blocks. The best one that I've used in the past was the superlative arms because it is click adjustable, meaning that you can actually have clicks that you can count through in order to fine tune a proper gas position, as opposed to a lot of adjustable gas blocks, which have one infinitely variable set screw to adjust the gas and then a second set screw to lock the first set screw in position. And then I guess the second set screw is just magically doesn't need its own set screw. It's, fuck it. Who cares? If you're an engineer, by the way, I'm saying a lot of this stuff just to piss you off specifically, so there's no need to try to give me a lecture in the comments section. Anyway, the Superlative Arms adjustable gas block is a good gas block, but I think it's more of a set and forget type of system, kind of like any of those set screw gas blocks. You're going to find a setting on that gas block that works well for your gun, both suppressed and unsuppressed, or just suppressed if you have no intention of ever taking the suppressor off, and you're going to leave it like that. Part of that is because the idea that you'll just like toss the can on and then pull out your super long Allen key and then count through like 20 clicks so you can go from your suppressed setting to your unsuppressed setting or vice versa, like in the field or something or at the range, just kind of ridiculous. I don't think that's ever going to happen. I don't think anybody actually does that. They just kind of like the idea of it. The other issue is that the gas block may freeze up. Maybe it will get carbon locked or maybe you'll have your rifle out with you overnight. It'll get a little bit of moisture on it in the morning. Everything will sort of rust together. As long as you never have to adjust the gas system again, that's not going to be a problem. But if you do pull out your Allen key and decide you're going to crank the gas up a little bit because boy, it sure is a frosty morning. Turns out the entire thing rusted shut and then you just round out the inside of your hex screw. Well, your gas block just went from adjustable to fixed really fast, and you better hope it was fixed in a good position and not a bad one. This might sound like unjustified paranoia, and you can call me a Luddite all you want, but I've been on some camping trips where we all woke up in the morning and some of the guns were brown. Remember, kids, if you're cold, they're cold. Bring them inside. Starting off on six, unsuppressed. That is with uh, Indian SDI M193. It's not M193, it's false advertising. It's definitely just 223. Uh, <laughs> that feels like it's barely cycling. It's ridiculously soft. The brake obviously helps a little bit. <laughs> Damn. Probably, uh, let's crank it up to eight because that ejection pattern is uh, not, not confidence inspiring. I'm also going to be nicer to my steel by missing. Last shot, it's proper lock back. Oh man, that ammo smells like poop. Well, that was 20 minutes of preamble we definitely could have done without. Anyway, I went with the rifle speed adjustable gas system. I used one of these to fine tune the gas system on a Ruger SFAR. Apparently, rifle speed saw that video and enjoyed it. And they reached out and said, hey, if you've got any more projects that require a rifle speed, let us know. And luckily, I did need another rifle speed gas block, so they sent me this one which turned out to be extremely beneficial for this video's budget because I bought three different handguards trying to find one that was going to work properly with this gun. Nice. Now we have Lake City, proper high pressure M193 556, suppressed and unsuppressed, starting at setting eight. Still what I would consider to be soft ejection, setting 12. 
still rather soft. All right, suppressor. Dial back to four. Suppress setting four, M193. That's a nice clean ejection. So the advantage of the rifle speed gas block, as we talked about in the SFAR video, is that instead of having 48 settings that you click through with an Allen key, which represents many, many revolutions of the set screw on the gas block, this one has 12 settings that are clearly labeled and marked on the adjustable collar. You grab it with your fingers and you twist and you know exactly what setting you're on. Because the system only has 12 settings and they're very clearly marked and you can tell which one you're on, you can just remember which one is your suppressed setting and which one is your unsuppressed setting. You could even write them down on the gun if you wanted to. You can switch between your suppressed and unsuppressed settings extremely quickly. Even if the gun is relatively hot, just a pair of gloves will protect you from the heat in the gas block and you can grab that and twist it and change the setting very fast. And if you're shooting ammunition that's weaker than usual, or you're in a cold environment, or the gun is starting to foul up, you can just click it up one to add a little bit more gas to the system. If the 12 settings on the rifle speed gas block aren't sufficient to cover the range of gas adjustment that you need, you can actually swap out the plunger on the inside for a different one. It's extremely easy to switch out the plunger, and they have a whole bunch of different ones available, so you can either go up or down in the gas adjustment range. This upper does not have the default plunger in it. I actually swapped to the other one that's included in the package, which adds more gas into the system. The default's a little bit more restricted, but on this dissipator build, we didn't need that much restriction. Buffered it back up to an H buffer. Gas setting three, I don't think will be enough with the H. Oh, that works. So the main problem with the rifle speed gas block is that you need to have access to the adjustable collar. You can't just stick a super long Allen key down the throat of the handguard. Rifle speed has several different lengths of adjustment collar from less than an inch all the way up to like four inches. So you can get one that extends all the way out the front of the handguard. But because this is a dissipator and the gas port is all the way at the end of the barrel, essentially, we can use the shortest adjustment collar on the rifle speed. That's a nice bonus. We don't have to use one of the super long adjustment collars that adds weight to the front of the gun and also because because it covers the entire distance between the gas block and the end of the handguard could block a bunch of M-lock attachment slots at the front of the gun. And I'm not sure if you've noticed, but the M-lock attachment slots at the front of the gun are the ones you typically want to use. So yeah, functionally, this thing is pretty fantastic. We have easy access to adjust the gas. We have plenty of adjustment to cover the suppressed and unsuppressed settings. And we didn't have to go crazy with buffer weights. I've tested this with an H1 buffer as well as just a regular carbine buffer. And it works actually quite well with the carbine buffer. This is a pretty aggressive Reardon single port brake at the front. Combine that with the ability to turn the gas most of the way off, and that means we can turn the recoil most of the way off. Yep. A lot of brake, not a lot of gas, if you know what I'm saying. For the sake of reliability, I would probably run it a lot higher, but we can actually restrict the gas enough that we can drop an aluminum bolt carrier group into this thing and make some kind of fearsome monster of a competition gun. Most of you probably didn't know that aluminum BCGs were actually a thing you could buy, but they are. Uh, they last slightly less long than the gas rings on a regular BCG, so it's probably not something I'd recommend for like a defensive carbine, but if you're a competition shooter and you really want to just turn off the recoil so you can focus on target transitions instead, uh, it's an option, I guess. Let's see what kind of gas it takes to drive this aluminum carrier and uh, how different the recoil impulse feels. Good grief. Might even be able to go down to four. Nope, four is too much. Or too little, rather. Six, let's go for six. Wow. That's kind of outrageous. All right, so this video is just so fucking long and I've been rambling so much. Let's just talk about the build specifics. This is based around a KAK Industry 16-inch rifle length gas barrel. If you want to know a lot more about this barrel specifically, there's a video that Focus Strip did, including accuracy tests and burn downs and all that sort of stuff. I'd suggest you go watch it. He gives this thing the thumbs up and I think he would know. The important thing about this build is the handguard selection, or at least it's important to me because I went through three different handguards trying to find the right one for this build. The first one that I went with was the Midwest Industries Night Fighter 13 and a half inch M-Lock handguard. 
I thought that would be a good pick for the build because it's a lot more rigid than most Midwest handguards because it uses a very long, heavy barrel nut, and there's also a lot more material on the handguard. There is not a lot of clearance between the rifle speed gas block and the handguard at the front, and so I was thinking, hey, anything we can do to minimize the flex of the handguard is probably a good thing. Unfortunately, the Night Fighter handguards are heavy as shit, but I knew that going in. I mean, it's listed on the fucking website. How could I not know? But the bigger issue, as it turns out, is that 13 and a half inches is not quite enough to fully cover a rifle length gas block. If you use a 12.625 handguard, which Midwest makes a whole bunch of, they go exactly as far as the gas block, but no further. If you use a 13.7 inch handguard, which Midwest does not make, that goes all the way to the front of the gas block. I know this is going to sound like I have a terminal case of OCD, but the fact that just a sliver of the gas block was poking out in front of the handguard really bothered me with that 13.5 Night Fighter rail. I did have a CMT cross machine and tool 137 handguard in inventory, but that handguard was earmarked for a different build, so I had to go buy another handguard, and so I ended up going with a Midwest Industries 14 inch G4 rail. The reason I got the G4 is because the rifle speed gas block way at the front of the handguard is going to make the last M lock slots kind of unusable on this gun. So I figured if I wanted to be able to attach my sling way out at the front of the handguard, well, the G4 rail from Midwest has anti-rotation sling QDs all the way at the front and the rear on three sides of the handguard. Because they stick out from the handguard a little bit, I thought I would still be able to get a QD in there without contacting the gas block. Boy, was I wrong. Doesn't work. But 14 inches still seems like the best length for this setup, and basically nobody other than Midwest makes 14-inch handguards, so I replaced it with one of their SL rails, the slim ones. Not one of the combat rails, but the slim rail specifically, because this one actually has a different geometry at the front. As you can see, the M-lock slots on the SL rail start a little bit farther back, and there's that kind of flared, rounded section at the front which just so happens to be a great fit for the rifle speed and the dissipator in general. So, synergy. We achieved it. It took three fucking handguards, purchased at full MSRP, and sold at a catastrophic loss, but we got there. The other handguard that would work here, maybe even better, would actually be the Midwest Industries Quad Rail, which is also available in a 14-inch length. And because with a quad rail, you attach all the accessories externally, none of them have to intrude into the space between the handguard and the barrel, well, nothing's going to touch the barrel or the gas block. So yeah, that's the build. We're able to get this thing to shoot extremely well and reliably with a bunch of different ammunition types, suppressed and unsuppressed. We can adjust it on the fly, and it's extremely fun to be able to just turn the recoil off with a few clicks of the gas block, but also know in the back of your mind that if you really need it to be reliable again, you can crank the gas back up to a more intermediate setting. Dude, this BCG is just, I hate to use the word, but squirting on these magazines. The real question then is, should you build one of these? Or maybe the question is, why shouldn't you build one of these? Because this seems like it's completely better than a 16-inch mid-gas setup. Well, first of all, if you're not going to use a suppressor, then no, you shouldn't bother with this because 16-inch mid-gas unsuppressed is still the platonic ideal of the AR platform. Otherwise, if this build fits all your criteria, like specifically you want a 16 inch barrel, you don't want to do like a pin and weld configuration, you also want to be able to run it both suppressed and unsuppressed, and you're okay with spending, you know, $200 on a gas system because this is quite a lot more expensive than a pinned low pro gas block and gas tube that you'd get on like a BA barrel or something then I would say, yeah, totally, go for it. But keep in mind, you are going to be a little bit limited in your handguard selection. I mean, if you want it to look as hella flush as this guy right here, you're going to have to find yourself a good 13.7 or 14-inch rail. And also be aware that there are not a lot of sources of 16-inch rifle-length gas barrels. This one is from KAK Industries. I think you can also get a Criterion Hybrid, which is a 16-inch rifle gas that does have the advantage of being chrome-lined. But then again, it's a Criterion, so it's never actually been in stock before. Four and it costs 350 bucks. If you're dead set on a duty grade cold hammer forged chrome line barrel, I don't think you're going to find a dissipator version of that anytime soon. But also keep in mind what I mentioned at the beginning of the video, which is that this same principle could be applied to a 12.5 mid or a 10.3 carbine. I think the 12.5 mid version of that might actually be the coolest one. You can still use the short rifle speed gas control and I think a 10.5 handguard to get the same kind of flush aesthetic that we got going on with this one here. 
All right, my cat is starting to knock stuff over, which is a sure sign that I have gone on way too long and need to stop this video. So thank you guys very much for watching. If you like this type of content, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Otherwise, you will not be permitted to watch any more of it. That's just the rule. You can also check the links in the video description for Subscribestar and Linktree for ways to support this show directly. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and I will see you guys next time. Hey, buddy. Can I get the full claw deployment real quick? Let me see him. Let me see him. Come on. All right. Too tired to even threaten me with violence, huh?